Okay folks, uh, we're back again here for another installment of the uh, Baruch College CIS Major series of videos. Uh, this video will be on the major track of financial IT or financial information technology. Uh, as always, a little bit about your presenter, um, Professor Richard Holizak. Here's my um, website on CISnet and my personal website on hollisac.com. As always, your comments, suggestions, questions are welcome and we will incorporate those into other videos. So, we spent uh, the first two videos, I think, on this series talking about the CIS major. Um, we spent quite a bit of time talking about the uh, four required courses, CIS 3100, 3400, 4800, and 5800, uh, which is the capstone course. And the idea behind uh, this new set of videos is to talk about uh, what you can put together in terms of all of these elective courses. So here we have 19 or possibly 20 elective courses. and. Uh, students ask all the time, how do I choose a set of these courses that sort of makes sense, that kind of aligns with my interest? Um, and so for this one, what we're going to talk about is financial IT. Okay, so uh, as with all of the um, CIS majors, you have a set of required courses, Object Oriented Programming 1, Database Management Systems, and Systems Analysis and Design. Uh, all of those are typically taken sort of early on in the program, and then we finish up at the end of the program with CIS 5800, the IT Development and Project Management. And so what that leaves you with is four electives, and for the financial IT, here's a set of courses that um, might make sense if you picked four out of these. And obviously there's more than four choices here, and we can talk a little bit more detail about why you might want to choose some of these over another. Um, two that I can definitely um, highly recommend would be the e-business technologies uh, and uh, the financial information technologies, which is actually the course that I teach. Um, those seem to be um, the best aligned courses for um, someone who's interested in the world of financial IT. Uh, so why am I excited about financial IT? Well, I get to work in this place. This is the Wasserman Trading Floor in the Sabotnik Financial Services Center at Baruch College. Um, here we have about 45 workstations on the trading floor. We have a fairly large sized uh, server room in the back uh, where we collect mountains of financial data. Um, we teach our students here at Baruch how to work with uh, all of the latest financial software tools like Bloomberg and Reuters, um, Capital IQ, uh, data mining tools from SAS and Statistica Data Miner, uh, broker oriented tools and APIs from uh, interactive brokers and um, Thinkorswim and TradeStation. Uh, so just a ton of resources that we have here. We do free workshops and so on. Um, and so the idea was, how can we take a wonderful resource like this trading floor um, and explicitly create a course or create a curriculum that ties together the world of finance and technology? Um, and so this is not a typical concentration area or a major track area that you're going to see at most business schools. Uh, and if I do say so myself, I think we do a great job of it. Um, so here's a very confusing diagram. Um, you'll probably want to cry the first time you see it, but there is actually some logic to this. Uh, so first what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk through uh, one aspect of financial uh, information technology. And this has to do with the world of exchanges and market centers, uh, places like the New York Stock Exchange or the NASDAQ or Direct Edge or BATS. Um, you know, we sometimes hear about these things, these exchanges. And essentially what they do is um, anytime someone puts an order into an exchange to buy or sell, say, some stock or a futures contract or an options contract or something, the result of that order is market data. And market data gets broadcast out, um, carried by uh, financial network providers uh, to the customers. And the customers are represented by all of this activity that's in the upper part of the graph. So basically everything except the exchanges and the network providers. And so a few things they need to do is um, 
when this market data comes in, uh, the brokers and, and dealers need to parse that data. They need to bring the market data in and make sure that there are no errors in the data, uh, that no packets are dropped. Uh, if you've ever worked with um, networks, we know that uh, one of the wonders of, of TCP IP protocol on networks is that uh, when packets are lost, and they can get lost for a bunch of reasons, we have ways of recovering um, and asking for retransmissions. And so that's really what this feed handler is here to do. It's to parse the data and make sure we're not missing any data. Once that data is ingested and, and parsed, it gets handed up to these upper levels. Um, things like historical tick databases. So uh, today, all brokers have to store a lot of market data. Um, if a client comes back to them and says, I don't think you handled my order properly, uh, the broker needs to be able to go back and see exactly what the state of the market was when that, um, that customer's order has come in. Um, they may also house uh, reference data. Uh, this is um, data that's changing much less frequently, but is used to tie together all of the different financial instruments. So, for example, we know from a company that they'll have a balance sheet and they'll have a certain number of shares outstanding. Um, they'll have analysts who are following the company that are giving recommendations and, and so on. Uh, and all of that c gets handled here in the reference data. Um, the complex event processing systems are in some sense like databases. Um, the key difference here is that they are analyzing data as it arrives. With a historical database or a tick database, the data has to be put into the database first before it can be queried. A complex event processing system is going to analyze the data on the fly. All of these sources of data are used to inform things called analytics. Analytics are pricing models. Um, they're using some type of computer formula along with reference data, historical data, and signals from a complex event processing system uh, to generate some type of theoretical price or some type of trading signal that's then going to be used to inform a trading decision. Now, this trading decision historically has been made by a human being, but increasingly these trading decisions are made by computer algorithms. Okay? Uh, the other big portion that informs the trading decision would be a risk management system. So depending on how much trading uh, the firm has done during the day, depending on whether their trades are making money or losing money, the risk management system is also going to be there to inform uh, the trading decisions. Once a trading decision is made, um, that information is going to be sent to an order management system or what are sometimes called execution management systems. Um, sometimes clients are also passing orders in here. So not only is the firm making their own trading decisions, but the client is also uh, giving them instructions to trade. And that results in a stream of orders. So the order management system will send out an order. Uh, that order will get routed to an exchange. Um, so the order routing decision could decide, I like that exchange, they have a good price, or I can trade there very cheaply right now, and so that's why I'm going to route to that exchange. And as we started this whole conversation, what happens when an order arrives at an exchange that results in new market data? And so the whole cycle repeats here, around in a big circle. So all day long, we have firms that are receiving market data, they are uh, parsing it, they're storing it, they're generating signals, um, they're informing analytics, they're making trading decisions which result in orders, and the orders are coming right back into an exchange and the cycle continues. Uh, this little spot out here when trades happen, um, they need to get reported for clearing and settlement. And so that's a whole nother area of what we call back office processing, where uh, trades between two counterparties are matched up. So that's a pretty um, a thrilling story. It happens billions of times a day in each firm. And so the question is, if you wanted to dive into this world, if you wanted to be an actor somewhere on this stage, what would you need to know uh, to be an effective IT person? Um, there are a ton of different roles here, everything from infrastructure, making sure the networks and databases and operating systems are running properly, to um, software development roles, uh, to database um, uh, administrator roles, uh, 
all, all across the board. Uh, so financial firms are voracious uh, consumers of IT and they need um, IT staff across the board. So I guess some of the things that we could highlight here at sort of the lower levels would be the networks and telecommunications, right? So all of this market data gets transmitted over um, network providers. And so understanding things like how the TCP IP protocol works, the difference between UDP and TCP, um, the difference between uh, a point-to-point -point, uh, point protocol or something like a multicast or a broadcast protocol. All of these things are enormously beneficial um, for someone who's interested in that role in either architecting, uh, designing, or supporting network systems in financial IT. Um, up from this, we have obviously the roles in the database systems. So we already talked about the required course of CIS 3400 talking about SQL, right? The structured query language. Uh, we did that in a couple of other videos. And so the reference database and historical database, they're all run off of SQL databases. So these could be a big DB2 or Oracle database. An order management system is also a large database, so that's also going to have to deal with um, some type of relational database on the back end. Database management systems too just goes into these technologies in more depth, um, so that's a role that they would have to play there. Um, now, object-oriented programming actually has quite a, an integrated role here. I mean, you see it with the analytics, with things like feed handlers, with order management systems, with order routing. Um, it shows up all over the place. And the main reason for this is that really C++ is the core programming language used in, in just about every financial services firm. Uh, C++ is used not only for its object orientation, but for its speed of execution. So if you can imagine data coming at you um, coming out the firm in millions of messages per second and some analytic pricing model that needs to take in that data, uh, create a theoretical price or, or create some type of a trading signal and, and inform a trading decision in a timely fashion, that analytic has to run at literally the, practically the speed of light. Okay, so C++ tends to be the language of use for things like feed handlers and, and analytics. Um, many aspects of order management systems also tie into things like analytics, so uh, they're also going to be coded in, in uh, C++. Same deal with order routing systems. Once an order is ready to go out to an exchange, that order routing decision has to happen as fast as possible, uh, so C++ is going to be used there. Um, now. On things like user interfaces, we sometimes see a language like C Sharp is being used, maybe some implementations using Java. Um, so depending on the task, uh, other programming languages might be used. Um, what employers tell us from financial services is students cannot have enough C++. Uh, if you're a great C++ programmer, you can probably get into the world of Java without too much difficulty, um, or even the world of C Sharp. Now, uh, last but not least, and I kind of wrote this over on the other side, um, the CIS 4620 is the Financial Information Technologies course. The course is basically all of this. Um, so from soup to nuts, what are the major financial instruments that trade? How do they trade on exchanges or over-the-counter markets? The mechanics of that trading, and then what are the technologies that support all of that trading and banking activity, all the way out to the clearing and settlement, which we uh, we pointed out uh, before. Um, so, what do feed handlers have to do? What do um, complex event processing systems do? How does one program on a tick database, a special type of historical database that's um, specially designed to work only with uh, market data. Um, how are analytics written? Students do projects in how they develop analytics. What is the role of a risk management system? What if you got on a project team where your firm is developing a risk management system? What would you have to do? What, was, um, what are the major steps in developing a risk management system? Uh, how do order management systems and execution management systems interact with order routing and exchanges? Uh, so that's really the, the, 
really the bread and butter here of the CIS 4620. So again, if financial IT is something that interests you, you maybe have an interest in financial markets, maybe you trade your own portfolio or you like messing around with, uh, with stocks and bonds and things, um, and you really want an explicit way to tie that together with the technology, this would be a great um, way to do that. Uh, so again, depending on which aspect of financial IT you're interested in, um, you know, obviously I'm going to recommend the financial information technologies. Uh, you might want to do more database object or database systems or object-oriented programming. Um, on the other hand, you might want to look more at uh, e-commerce systems in general, and there are the e-business technologies course I can recommend for you. Okay, so I think that about covers it for uh, this session. As always, happy to hear your comments and suggestions, and uh, thanks again for uh, tuning in.